All right, we got it, man. Yo, pal, let's do this. I'm Ready? adjusting the zoom window so that you're at the top of my screen. So I'm looking toward the camera. You were down at the bottom. So there you go, man. I was wondering why you were looking at me that way. That's right. You're like, stop looking. You're like, I'm up here. I'm up here, Hal. Stop looking at my crotch. <laughs> Dude. Uh, hey, first of all, let me just say I'm pumped to go wake surfing tomorrow, man. That's a first. And sitting with my family this week at Osborne's Lake House, looking out at the water, it seems like everybody's wake surfing. It's like, I, I, in fact, arguably nine out of 10 boats that I saw, we had people wake surfing. Yeah, that's great. Has no, it always I, it's been the, popular or did it just blow up? Um, no, you're just old and you and I are old. <laughs> uh, so we just noticed it. But the, the cool kids have been doing it for a long time, I think. Uh, yeah. No, but it's, it is great in a lot of ways, especially though if you are getting older and uh, your body feels those hits on the wakeboard when you smack the water, wake surfing is this like, that's actually how it was explained to me by a friend of mine who's in his 40s. He's like, dude, yeah, you got to wake surf. He's like, when you fall, it's like falling on pillows, yeah. right? Versus like the wakeboarding where you get a concussion every other time that you hit the water. And I'm like, oh God, I'm tired of concussions. I, I, need, I need to wake surf. So yeah. It's, These guys look like they were going at five miles an hour. It they looks dude, like they the didn't most fall over and you're like, <laughs> you just like, you just sink all slowly. And yeah, it's, it's wonderful. Great sport, man. I'm pumped. So yeah. Yeah. Hey, um, we should take a moment here real quick before we get into this and acknowledge the fact that while many people are in our community and know who you are, uh, other people might have just found this podcast and be like, who are these two clowns <laughs> and why have they said nothing about who either? Yeah, what are they talking about? <laughs> so let's take a moment and, uh, and address that. So uh, for anybody who might be newer to the Front Row Dads community, I'm here with one of my best friends in the world, Hal Elrod. And uh, we're just talking family life. And one of the things I wanted to get into here today is that things for Hal have been really good lately. And this has been a part of our repeated conversations that his marriage is in the best spot it's ever been in. He feels the best he's ever felt as a father, more engaged with his kids than ever before. And I'm like, we've got to talk about this. And this is a really great conversation. So um, we're going to talk about that today. But before we do, how would you sum up Let's do our bio. Let's, how, how would you sum up our bio together um, in like a minute or less? Uh, so John Vroman met me at an event and did not like me because I'm kind of loudmouth and excitable and, uh, you know, and it can come across the wrong way if you don't know my heart and my intention. So he was like, who's this douchebag Hal? <laughs> like, why does he talk so much? <laughs> that, that, that was my understanding of how you received me. And, uh, and then he brought me in to speak at an event. Uh, John and I were working for the same Cutco company, brought me in to speak at an event. And, uh, and we got to know each other a little more and we started to really like each other and became actually slowly but surely just became really good friends. And a few years ago, John came to visit. Uh, we had a recruit, my wife and I had a recruiting mission for he and his wife, Tatiana. We, uh, we said, hey, come visit us in Austin. And the entire time we're plotting, okay, where are we going to take them? Which way will we turn their body at which times so that they fall in <laughs> love with Austin and they want to move here? Like it was, it was very manipulative and, uh, and it worked. Uh, <laughs> Thank God, man. So I know. So, such I a know. Here. Yeah. And so you moved here and you live here. And now uh, we, we actually, I mean, we've become really good friends, but really even in the last few months, we've had some deep conversations and like, hey, let's take our friendship to like the next level and then the level beyond that. And then like, how could we be the best friends, right? Two best friends that anyone could have with what, from, <laughs> from something. Um, but how can we be like, like, like have a, a friendship that, well, John, you said it, right? You're the one that put the word and it's really from our other friend, John Kane, legendary. Like how could we have a friendship that is so authentic and yeah. vulnerable and deep and connected and mutually beneficial that, you know, stories will be written about it someday, right? That like, yeah. that, 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 that we're, we're, li we're writing the handbook through the way that we live our friendship uh, in a way that we can share with other people. Cause that's one thing that I think you and I share in common, right? Is that we live our lives as examples. We, we, we we're trying to go through the fire and, and live our lives a, in a way that we can go first and, and, and learn the lessons through making a lot of mistakes and screwing up and, and, and reading a lot of books and learning from masters that have gone before us. And, 
And then how can we pay that forward and share it with other people? And so uh, I think that recently you and I have taken our friendship to that level. And uh, yeah, man, it's, uh, it's really been awesome. Well, when you think about being a great husband, being a great dad, you, 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 and you think about what are the pillars of what makes that work, right? One of them has to be uh, surrounding yourself with other great people that you can learn with and from in that space. It has sure. to be. And then the other piece of that is, I, don't, I, don't, I think sometimes you can just gel with somebody, you can just click and it feels more natural. But even in those situations, you have to intentionally design what you want it to be about, right? And you mentioned him, John Kane, who I remember multiple times throughout the last 20 years, our friendship goes, spans back 20 years, that he would come to the conversation with, how are we going to keep our friendship growing? Like, it wasn't just, hey, let's get together and joke and hang out and have a good time. It was literally like he said, this is an important relationship to me. Mm -hmm. How are we going to get together? Let's find time on the calendar. Let's make this work right? Like this is too important to let go. And that type of, you know, intention and focus is really important. And even in our band. So anybody that's not part of Front Row Dad's community uh, yet, or that you're newer to our community, we have these small groups of like up to four guys and we call them bands. So it's a play on band of brothers and it's a play on literally being in a band, right? Our band is called Blue Zone, right? As in, you know, the pockets of the, the world that where people live the longest, happiest, healthiest lives. Well, in our band, in our recent conversation, we brought the same question to the table. Who do we want to be for each other? How honest do we want to be? How do we want to show up for each other? How, if, if somebody has a concern about somebody else in the group, like, hey, I something's going on, you might not be aware of it. How do you want to receive that information? So even as close as we are as friends, having those types Types of dialogues is critical. So, yeah. and that it's those conversations, by the way, that, that now I know, and I'm going to come full circle here, that that's why I know that things are going so well for you is we have these like open, honest, transparent dialogues. So um, I want to get into that in just a second. But uh, the biggest thing would be this. If you don't know how, you got to check out the Miracle Morning book. That's all I'm going to say about his bio is that the Miracle Morning book is uh, absolutely an extraordinary read. It's taken the world by storm, published in I don't know how many languages, 30, 37. 37 languages. Holy cow. 2 million practitioners around the world. Um, and uh, I don't, last I checked, it's got the over 3000 reviews on Amazon, which is insane. And uh, buddy, I'm just so proud of you for the work that you're doing with the whole Miracle brand and the new book, The Miracle Equation. It's all so great. Um, and you really live, you know, you walk the talk, you know, uh, in a big way. So uh, that's all I'm going to say about that. But uh, all you have to do is do a quick search for how Elrod of the Miracle Morning and you'll have all the bio you need to, <laughs> to last you a lifetime. But dude, let's talk family life. Let's get yeah. into it right away. And maybe I'm just going to leave it open ended because you like this. And maybe this will be the only question I ask. <laughs> <laughs> you could just talk for the next 30 minutes. Uh, but dude, it, uh, it, it, feel free. By the way, for me, um, and feel free to take that call if you need to. No. <laughs> Whatever you want. Dude, you said I'm going to leave my phone on. All right, I'll turn it off. Jesus. Just make a text during the interview. <laughs> <laughs> I really was joking, but then I forgot to turn it off. So, yeah. Hey, look, uh, why is it going well, man? Why the marriage? Why, why parenting right now? Why is it going so well? Yeah, let me say this. Uh, you know, I, I, uh, I was, I mean, as you know, I've been doing a lot of really like deep, uh, meditation, introspective work, like connecting to higher consciousness, spirituality. Uh, and I, I feel like I am, I'm on a different plane than I've ever been before. And um, I'll give you an example. Last week, um, I woke up Friday morning and uh, I was flying to, where was I going? I don't know. It doesn't matter. I was going to a city uh, to speak and I had to, I, my flight was at 9am and, and I was packing and everything and it was like 8am and I go, I have to record a podcast. I realized like, I did hit me. I'm like, I don't have a podcast. You know, I, I hosted a podcast called achieve your goals and I didn't have a, an episode. I go, Oh crap. Oh, what am I going to do? And I'm, 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 you know, and I go, I, I got to record an episode. And so I'm sitting there and you know, my brain does not work very well on demand. Right. So I'm like, what am I going to talk about? Uh, I don't know. I should talk about like human nature, you know, and I, I'm, I'm, and I can't, I'm just, I got writer's block and I can't get an outline. Right. And um, I, uh, I'm going off on a little tangent, but it'll circle back. Tangent, it'll, be buddy, tangent. it'll be great. Um, but, uh, but anyway, I literally like, I just got real quiet and did like a little meditation and just you know, like a little prayer. And I was like, God, I was like, 
I'm just going to hit record, kind of like we did today, right? But I go, I'm going to hit record and f- just speak through me. Like whatever words the listeners, my audience needs to hear today. I, I, that, I, and I just had faith that it was going to be mm. great. And, and John, uh, it was the best podcast I've ever recorded in my entire life. And so much so that, or I'm just delusional. It's, it's one of the two. <laughs> so much so, and I, well, actually, I'm usually critical, right? We're critical of our own work. So normally I'm like, oh, that was terrible, right? But I, when I sent it to my podcast producer, I CC'd five members of my team and said, hey, everybody, this is the most important podcast episode I've ever recorded. And it is, uh, in case you want to, I want everyone to listen to it. I'm, I'm asking, I'm inviting you to. Um, but if you want to listen to it before the rest of the world, I'd love for you to. And that, it'll come out this next Wednesday, right? Or, oh, it came out today, actually. Um, but, but anyway, so that's how important it was. But the point of all of that is I'm not coming from my head very much right now, right? Like, I've kind of surrendered to the, the, the uh, how do I put it? Um, to my heart, if you will, to my soul. And, and I think that, yes, there's got to be head here. In fact, I'm actually, if you're listening to this right now, I want you to know that I, I say this humbly and gratefully, my marriage is not just the best it's ever been, but it's, it's better than I ever have imagined in my entire life that I could ever be in a marriage that could be this good. Like, it's that extraordinary. Um, and as a father, I, my relationship with my kids is by far better than it's ever been. And it's not like it's better. It was like crappy. And now it's like, Oh, kind of good. Like it is equally the best I could ever imagine it being. And two years ago I was in the hospital fighting cancer and I didn't see my kids very much for an entire year. And I completely lost connection with them. Um, not completely, but, but, but I lost it for me. I didn't really lose it, but for them, there, there were four and seven and at that age, you don't, you know, you're still developing a relationship with your dad. For me, I'm, I, you know, I'm all in. I could not see him for five years and love him just the same. But, but for me, they were, my, my, my son wasn't comfortable hugging me. He, you know what I mean? Like, it, I mean, I was, I, it was heartbreaking how I lost connection with him. So to go from the worst our relationship had ever been, and with my wife too, because, you know, cancer, I'm gone, right? To go from the worst my relationship had ever been with my wife and with my kids. And that was probably, you know, a year, year and a half ago. And now it is the best it's ever been. So I'm I'm starting there. And I want you to know if you're listening to this, I'm going to give you hacks. I'm going to give you actionable strategies and rituals and routines that you can implement into your daily life, your weekly life that will radically, that have allowed for this. You know, for me, I'm all about dumbing things down and simplifying and strategizing and making things simple and actionable. And I do that for myself. You know, what are the simplest, easiest things I can do that will move the needle in my life, in my business, with my friendships, with my relationships? So I'm just giving you like the kind of the, 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 the light at the end of the tunnel, the promise, like we're going to end this thing with you having specific strategies that you can implement into your world, into your life, into your marriage, into your relationships with your kids that don't take a lot of time, effort, or energy that will pay you radical dividends. Your return on investment will be extraordinary. So that's where we're going to go with this, John. I don't know if I think you, I I probably need to give more context around (laughs) how my marriage is. I don't even remember what we're talking about, but what's going on? (laughs) What what I love about you, buddy, and this is always the case and, and people could listen to us rant on the, the five habits episode as well. We had you on, um, we, we talked earlier about, when was it last year sometime? I don't remember yeah, what- about a year ago. ago. Yeah, about a year ago, we had Hal on as well. Um, episode number, it was up episode number 11. You were number 11. That's a, wow. great, that's a great number, man. That's the front um, row number, baby. So here we are. And I think this will be, as we release this, by the way, episode number 92, which is pretty mm-hmm. cool. To see it come this far. Um, why don't we start recent? Let's start recent and let's even talk about this summer. And even, even since we've recorded the five habits podcast, let's talk about even the last four weeks. Like you've been traveling, you've been with family. I saw you were in San Diego maybe, or, or yeah. um, you were in Cali with the crew, right? Sandy, four days with the kids uh, in San Diego. Yeah. Yeah. So may, maybe even talk about the last couple of weeks, like what, what's been happening recently in your world that's been working. 
Yeah. You know, how have these habits and new rituals and routines been playing out? All right. I'm going to ignore your question because I just thought of a different way I want to go. <laughs> <laughs> the benefit of being great friends. Um, that. Yeah. Thanks, John. Uh, right. Isn't that what you do in like interviews where when people go on like talk shows, they know they only have a limited time. So they just know what they're going to say. And then they figure out how to spin the question. We're very comfortable with each other. Hey, yeah. because you're doing that, I'm going to close my door. I can tell my friend. All right. Go close your door. All right. Um, although not seeing you kind of distracts me. I need to. Oh, there you go. Okay. Yeah, I need to. Seeing you makes me feel really safe and secure. You have one of those auras about you, Johnny. People feel safe and secure around you. So Thanks, man. people are going to be like, these two dudes have no value to add. They're just going to laugh and talk to each other the whole time. <laughs> That's why I made sure to let everybody know where we were going to end up in case it takes us a while to get, get promise. this. Big promise. Yeah. All right, That's let's... right. Um, no, so, so here's the deal. I, I had some realizations uh, a few months ago, and it was the idea that as, as fathers and as husbands, um, we, uh, you know, we're, 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 we're usually, many of us are providers, right? And not all, but many of us are providers, uh, or at least we have jobs, right? I would say that's true for most of us. We have work. And uh, especially if you're an entrepreneur, right? Your work takes on kind of like it, you never check in and check out, right? You're always thinking yep. about work because it's your business. It's your right. And so um, I yeah, realized- I'm supposed to be on vacation right now. <laughs> What'd you say? I'm supposed to be on vacation right now. Yeah, what Which is so doing? funny as you say that, like this is my, you know, we're on vacation. Yeah, you're on vacation working, recording a podcast. That's right. Um, but, uh, but, so, but some of the realizations that I've had that have led, so, so I think that's actually a good place to start, right? Is like, what are the, the realizations that I had that have led to the best marriage and the best, you know, relationship with my kids ever? Because that's the starting place. Because you don't have to have my same realizations if you're listening to this, but you got to have your own realizations. And my realizations uh, may inform your realizations. And in fact, they might even be the same. You might go, wow. That's something I need to realize. I need to be aware of that, right? So some things that I realized, first and foremost, and this actually goes back to right before I got cancer. So this is a good place to start. Um, the realization was around my wife, Ursula. Uh, we had the biggest, one of the biggest fights of our marriage right before she was going on vacation with my kids to go camping. And I was staying home because I had yet again another import quote unquote air quote important prior work priority right some sort of project was launching i don't even remember what it was well it just shows you it's funny i remember the family piece that i screwed yeah. up on royally but i don't even remember what the hell the work piece was right if i had a book launching or something so i said Urs, i can't go on this camping trip you and the kids need to go and we got into a huge blowout fight right before she left and when she left i uh, I, I came across she was gone i came across an article called um uh, it's something along the lines of uh, why you should choose her. It was something, well, I'll just, I'll just sum it up. It was the idea that this guy realized that he, the woman he was with, and they weren't married yet. Uh, they have never got married. In fact, he lost her. She left him. And he realized afterwards that, he, that she was the one that got away and he should have done this the right way. And that, and that was a wake-up call for me realizing I don't want to screw up my marriage the way he screwed up his relationship. And it was basically the idea that he realized he, was, he never fully chose his partner uh, in, in the way that he always was focusing on what was wrong with her. And so when I say choose her, you could also, another way of putting that and probably a more accurate way is he never loved her for who she was. He never loved her unconditionally. He was always finding faults and flaws and nitpicking this and that. And at that point, he was always had one foot out the door because, you know, they weren't married and he was always like, look, he was looking for greener grass. And I think that we do that in a few different ways. If you're single and you're dating someone, then looking for greener grass means you're looking at the flaws in your partner and you're thinking, man, I could find somebody better than her right? Someone that doesn't do this thing that annoys me. Someone that's more like me in this way, right? So that happens when you're single, greener grass is thinking maybe there, I should ditch this, per, this gal and I should find somebody else. Now, when you're married, it could show up that way. You could be on the fence. Maybe I should divorce this woman and find somebody more like me that doesn't have the things about her that I don't like in my wife, right? But another way that greener grass shows up is that you might just be comparing her against the, the perfect version of the woman you have in mind. And maybe you don't have one foot out the door in terms of finding a replacement, but you have one foot out the door in terms of trying to change her. So you don't have both feet 
committed to her. You've got one foot committed to her and you've got one foot out looking for a bet, trying to change her into the person that you want her to be. And that is not love. That is not commitment. At least that's not unconditional love. So I realized that I was doing that with my wife, Ursula, at the time. That I, was, that I had one foot out the door and I wasn't going to leave her. I mean, I'm sure that, that thought probably crossed my mind every once in a while in the heat of an argument or something, right? Like, ah, I can't put up with this anymore, you know, right? I mean, I think we all go through that at some level. But I definitely had the one foot out the door in terms of, man, if only she were a little more this and a little less this and did a little bit like this and was a little like that one girl I used to date, man, she was great in the way that she was like me, right? I had one foot out the door, I wasn't fully in. And I read that article and I realized, I need to choose my wife. And then I realized she can feel this from me. And my wife's a child of divorce. And so she has a deep seated fear um, of, you know, that, that, that I might leave her the way that her parents left each other. Right. So that, that's a very deep seated because there was a lot of pain growing up from that. And what I realized was that by me having one foot out the door and always trying to change her, see, that's it. Listen, fellas, are you always trying to change your wife? in some way? And are you always criticizing her? Are you saying you should do this differently? You should raise the kids differently. You should be different on and on. And I realized that by me doing that, I was perpetuating her greatest, one of her deepest fears, which was that I would leave her. And so I realized I need to choose her the way this guy was talking about in this article, in this, in this, in this blog post that he wrote that had been read by like a million people, right? Millions of people. And so I decided, I, so I first wrote an affirmation, right? I, I put this into an affirmation so that I can read it every single day and reinforce, I need to make Ursula feel that I am fully committed to her, that I love her exactly as she is. And if she never changes, I will not love her any less. In fact, I'm going to love her more from now on. And I owe her an apology that I have not loved her and chosen her fully. And so I wrote an affirmation and I decided I started reading it every single day while she was on vacation. And I sent her a few texts and left her a few voicemails, letting her know, you know, how I let it communicate that to her. And then I thought, you know what? I've been screwing her over by not choosing her and loving her unconditionally and wishing she were a little bit different for the last, how many years we were married at that point, five years or so. And I thought that means I've been reinforcing her fear, as I said, for five years. Me sending her a text message and leaving her a voicemail, probably not going to undo the harm that I have unconsciously done, right? Yeah, yeah. I thought I've got to do, I've got to do a, a, a hell of a lot more than that. And so I took my affirmation and I went on to shutter fly or shutter, is it shutter fly or shutter stock where you can make photos or shutter coffee fly. cups? What is it? I think it's Shutterfly, isn't it? Although I think it's I shutter. Know. Yeah, yeah, Shutterfly. You know, I think you're right. Shutterfly, S-H-U-T-T-E-R-F-L-Y. And by the way, everybody on this podcast, you should be, all the men, you should be using Shutterfly.com. And I'll give you one quick tip. This is a little bonus tip. You can go make placemats for your family. Each of my kids has a placemat that has their name in the middle of it. And it's surrounded by a collage of pictures of me and my wife and them just really fun memories. Mm. And every single day when they sit down to dinner, they get to look at memories of our family creating memories together. So just a little bonus. It was one of the greatest gifts that I've given them. And it's a cool gift, not only for your family, but actually just for your family is fine. I don't want you to realize I'm probably going to send one of the Romans of pictures of them and their <laughs> family uh, for Christmas. I think that's a cool gift. But anyway, so bonus tip. But here's what I did. I went on to Shutterfly. And I chose, I think it was one of, if not the largest image that they had that I could write text into. It was an 11 by 14 image. And it was a beautiful white frame with a white background that was the, that the, on the paper, it was framed by hearts. And I titled it, <clears throat> My Forever Pledge, I believe. It was called, or our, it was Our Forever Pledge. It's in my bathroom. If I could carry my computer, I would go show it to you. It's on our, yeah, it's on our, on our wall. But it was My Our Forever Pledge. And it was to Ursula, my wife for life, from Hal, your husband until the end. I'm getting emotional saying this. I don't know why. But anyway, and I basically took my affirmation 
and I reworded it so that it was about her. I said, Ursula, this is, this is for you. This, this is my commitment to you for the rest of our lives. <clears throat> There's nothing that you can do or not do to change that there, I will, <clears throat> that I will never leave you. And I basically thought through the lens of her fears and what I've done to perpetuate those. And, and I basically, I, I tried to imagine what would give her a sense of rock solid security and feel chosen by me and loved by me unconditionally. <clears throat> and, and I signed it. You know, I, I actually created like a, a PDF, you know, like I, I signed on my computer and then I printed my signature on the document. And I mean, and it was, you know, it's, it was the, the, I mean, the letters were each like a half an inch. I mean, it's a bit, you know, it was a large document. So it's a big thing. And I nailed a wall uh, or I, I put a nail in the wall right next to her bedside and I hung it at eye level so that every morning when she wakes up, she would, that's the first thing she would see when she woke up. And the last thing before she went to bed and I put it on her, I, I hung it there and uh, sorry, I'm getting emotional, but, um, but this was the first, this was the start of the most extraordinary marriage that, that we now have. That was the turning point. That was the first thing. And here's the deal, fellas, I made a decision that I was committed. This is my second decision. I, John, I shared this at the front row dads retreat a few years ago but I made a decision that my mission in life, in my personal life, I've got a professional mission, that's separate. But my mission in life, at least in my marriage, was to make her life amazing. And that's a real generic word, amazing. Well, but, I, but I had in my mind and in, in my affirmations, I had written what bullet points of what that meant. That meant for her to feel loved and cherished. And that's a word, by the way, Pay attention to the words your wives have used for years that you just fucking, dis sorry, pardon my French, that you just dismiss or you, 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 you fight. Like, I do that. I do. I already do that. You're so, you, you're ungrateful, right? Like, that's what we do. That's what I do, at least. My wife, I realize, has been telling me for years that she wants this. She wishes I would do more of this. And what I do in my brain is I automatically get defensive and I search for the areas that I already do. I'm like, but I do that. If I do that for you and I get upset, yeah. I can't believe you're complaining that I don't make you feel cherished when I do this and I do this and I do this and I do this. Damn it. If that's not enough to make you feel cherished I, and I throw my hands up, I don't know what I have to do. I don't know what I can do. And then I changed that. And I went, wait a minute. Maybe I do those four things that in my mind are fulfilling on what she tells me she needs. But if she's not feeling fulfilled in that need, then I need to do something different. And I'd encourage you to ask yourself that, consider that. What can you, what has your wife been telling you that you have been getting defensive about and justifying that you're already doing things that should make her feel that way that she's not feeling? Yeah. And I'm telling you, I don't, you need to do something different. Yeah. And ideally ask her what that is. And if she says, I don't know, don't throw your hands up. Don't ever throw your damn hands up. That's the key to a <laughs> shitty marriage. Got it? <laughs> unless, it's, unless, it's in, unless it's in victory. In the front row <laughs> symbol. Yeah. No, but be a freaking, be a man. Yeah. Be a man for your kids, for your husband. For, not your husband. Well, maybe your husband. I, I don't know. Um, <laughs> for your wife, right? Be a man and step up and figure it out and, and yeah. keep trying until, until... Yeah. She feels fulfilled. She feels cherished. She feels loved. She feels heard. She feels supported. Yeah. And so for me, I decided my mission is to make her life amazing. And that is do things every day that make her life easier. Do the dishes, watch the kids, let her go to bed early, let her take a bath while I do, while I make dinner, while I order dinner, while I do things that I don't have to do. I shouldn't have to do. I, I work all day. I provide for you. Great. You want to be a mediocre husband, have a mediocre marriage? Keep justifying mediocrity. Mm. And so, John, for me, I decided I'm going to make her life amazing. And here's the caveat, everybody. Listen to this. Really important. Despite how she responds. Very crucial. Yep. 
because we're programmed in our behavior and in our response and we have been for a long time. Her behavior is not going to change overnight just because yours does. And I acknowledge that thankfully on the front end. And, and here's, the, here's, a, here's a caveat to the caveat. I went, okay, I'm committed to making her life amazing every day in all the ways I just listed and more. Regardless of how she responds. And then here's, the, here's how I went even further. I said, so especially if she is rude to me, I will try even harder, right? So if she responds not the way I want, and that's what we do. We, we make a little wimpy effort and then she's, and then she doesn't, she's not grateful or she, or she's still upset or whatever. And then we throw our hands over like, yeah, see, I did exactly what you told me you wanted and you didn't give me the perfect response. So F you, I'm done with you, right? No, I can control your temper. Read a book on emotional intelligence, guys, and control your shit. And, 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 and if she is a bitch to you, try harder and keep trying and keep your unwavering commitment to make her life amazing. And it might take three months before she responds the way you want her to, because she needs to see that consistency from you over an extended period of time. That is your extraordinary effort. And I'll tell you, it, it took a while, right? She, she didn't respond right away. Uh, it probably took a few months, you know, and gradually I'd start to see it, but she didn't, you know, she, she wanted to, and I think often women test you. She's like, all right, yeah, you're giving a little effort. Let's see if you're really committed, right? They'll test you because they're afraid and they want to really see that you're committed no matter what unwavering commitment, unwavering, unconditional love. And so I meant to spend five minutes on that, but John, as you said, <laughs> <laughs> I called it, man. I yeah, there you go. But I, I feel like, I mean, you know, obviously you feel the passion for me because I feel so convicted in how important this is for you. And this is the springboard to the most extraordinary marriage that you can have. And here's the thing, for you to be the best dad, it starts with being the best husband. It absolutely starts with you getting your marriage right. Because if you work on the kids and you don't work on the marriage first and make it your number one priority, you'll be a kick-ass divorced dad. You follow? You'll be a kick-ass dad who is divorced because, yeah, you put your energy into the kids, but you didn't put the energy into your number one relationship. And as you've heard this before, the kids are going to grow up real fast. They're going to move out. And then you're going to be staring across the dinner table from that woman that you've either invested in making your best friend and the woman of your dreams and become the man of her dreams because that's going to be the rest of your life. The kids thing, that's, sh that's a short window. And, uh, and we can wrap up, by the way, with a few actionable strategies to both, as I promised, be a great dad in simple, easy ways and a great husband, John. Uh, but if you want to, I, I can go a little longer if you want to ask any like follow-up questions or comments or thoughts on what we've talked about, and then I can give the actionable hacks. Yeah, no, this is great, man. Um, and I should mention that uh, what's funny is if we were on your boat tomorrow morning and you were telling me this, it would have sounded the exact same. <laughs> <laughs> I just want everybody to know nothing <laughs> different. If I'm with Al and it's just the two of us, it would be the same type of conversation. <laughs> same type. Of, I always say, it's like, dude, if he's talking to 2,000 people, 15,000 people, or just me, I get the same intensity. Um, right. Hey, so a couple of things I want to reflect back. Uh, there was a lot of, there was a lot of gold in there, right? And, and so a couple of things. One, um, this idea of choosing your wife is just, it's, it's really a big, that's a big, uh, that, that's a, that's a big reminder for all of us, right? Even if somebody's like, I I've heard that, right. Make a choice step up, but to be reminded that with something we always need to be doing re, to choose again, to choose daily, right. Daily. It's a practice, the practice of choice, right. That's what I, I just, I think that's awesome. The forever pledge is awesome. I heard you say that I thought through the lens of her fears and immediately when you said that, I, I, I was reminded also, Hal, of why you've been successful it professionally is that if I go back as far as I can remember, back to the very first days where we started working together and hanging out and talking about life, you've always been great to then turn the conversation to, well, how does that land for other people? Whether you're titling a book or you're about to give a speech or whatever, you were very good at being audience centric or you know, if you're selling something, 
or trying to make an impact or whatever it might be. You just, you're good at saying, let me think about it through their, uh, from their perspective, which I think is great. You do that very well. And I just wanted to bring attention to that. You Mm -hmm. also said what would give her a sense of security and that she's being chosen by me. And I think that you pose that, that question is really cool. One that we can all sit with, right? I, I really liked that. Um, I also was laughing when you said that you would make dinner and then you corrected yourself to order dinner. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. I think that's a really good catch. Uh, um, and <clears throat> doing all of these things, despite how she responds, is very powerful. And you also said her behavior is not going to change overnight just because yours does. And I think that's a really important piece. You know, when, uh, and I've shared this with the group that when I was going through stuff with Tatiana, almost a year and a half ago. And I guess you're married, you're always going through stuff, but it was a really, um, it was a really big storm. I, I wrote my affirmation that you don't need other people's permissions. You don't need other people's permission to treat them well. And I was specifically relating to my wife that I don't need her permission to treat her with excellence. I don't need my kids permission or participation to treat them well. You don't need somebody to respond a certain way for you to act with integrity or love or whatever word you want to insert there. You can do it because it's who you are, because that's what you were born to do. That's that life that you were born to live. You do not. Now I get you're impacted by other people. Nobody's impervious to that, right? Like we all get affected by people. But if we remember to claim our power, to own our space, and, and, and this is my last piece, and then I got a question for you. Yeah. When you, you said it, like you've really got to nail the husband thing, right? And the reason why you've got to nail the husband thing is because when you get that right, the part of the relationship that'll challenge you the most, part of your family life that could potentially challenge you the most, but when you figure that out, when you own your space there, it naturally leads to you being a better dad. It actually, when you unlock that door, when you, when you have the keys to the kingdom there in your relationship, you, you automatically gain a few things as be, for being a dad. And part of that is just your personal power, owning your world, right? And not pointing the finger and blaming anybody else, but really stepping up. I see a lot of high-powered businessmen who are great at leading their teams, but sometimes when they get home, they fall apart. They're absolutely, they, they have no spine at home. And I'm not talking about dominating people. I'm talking about powerfully being a presence with people. You mm. can walk into a room and not say much, but people know you've got power, right? Because of the way you carry yourself. And it's not a dominance. It's not, a, it's not, tire, it's not being a tyrant. It's somebody who has confidence because they know who they are. And that like certainty is very attractive to your wife and it really allows you to lead your kids. So Mm -hmm. it's just something that uh, I wanted to bring the attention to. Now, here's a question for you and then let's get to the actionable stuff. Jesus, I thought you would never stop. You're so long-winded. Go ahead. (laughs) I want to go back. (laughs) When you got emotional talking about Ursula, why? I mean, I like seriously, right? Like what was coming up for you there? Why, why the emotion? I think because, you know, I, 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 don't, I, don't, I don't know, so I'll answer intuitively, right? Like, I mean, I didn't have a, like a, a real thought of here's why I'm emotional, but um, I just, I think because I was realizing uh, how, I think it was, I was just in touch with her feelings in that moment, right? Like that she was, she had a deep seated fear of, of, of me leaving her because she grew up as a child of divorce um, and how just kind of meaningful it was for me and for her um, that to, to be able to address one of her deepest fears. And, and honestly, in the same, on the, the other side of the coin of her deepest fear was her greatest desire, which was just to be loved unconditionally by someone who she knew would never leave her. And I'm getting emotional again, so that, I think I'm on the right track. <laughs> the right track <laughs> but someone who would never leave her, you know? And, uh, and just because that was her great, if, her, if your greatest fear is to be left and not loved, then your greatest desire is to be loved and cared for. And, and she, she always used the word cherished, you know? Yeah. So, well, there's something really special about a commitment for life and any relationship, a friendship or a, a marriage, anything transforms when you realize that this is, I want to do this forever. Right. Yeah. That just, it transforms it from the get go, transforms any business, right. Or yeah. any, any, anything that you're involved in. All right. Actionable stuff, buddy. What do you got? All right. So, uh, so as far as the actionable on, uh, the wife stuff, um, 
doing, uh, so we, you've heard this before, all right? So, but I'm going to try to share it in a quick in a, in a way and maybe give some context, but weekly date night. Um, but here's the deal. Weekly date night, uh, you got to actually treat it like a date. And here's what I mean. I, we were doing weekly date night for a long time. You just and had it was, one. What'd you say? You just had one, right? Oh, you I just had our overnight. That was our best overnight. ever, dude. It was off the chain. Yeah. Um, but, but as far as weekly that. date night, so yeah, so we do. So here's the deal. Here's what I recommend. Weekly date night and monthly overnight date. Mm -hmm. Now, if you cannot, if money is tight right now and you're like, oh, we can't go stay at a hotel like once a month, like we don't have that extra budget or whatever, um, do, or even, even, even every week, you're like, oh, we can't afford to eat out right now, whatever, um, go in the backyard and eat by a candlelight in the backyard, just a different setting than you eat dinner at every night, right? Uh, you know, go swap houses, house swap with your friend and be like, hey, let's do a weekly date night every other week, right? We both get a sitter and then we swap houses, right? Or whatever, right? I'm just, you know, just different ideas. Get creative. Don't use money as an excuse. Have a weekly date night with your wife. And what I encourage you to do is talk about what you're grateful for in the relationship, what you're excited about, and then ask, what can I do to be better for you? What can I do to be a better husband for you? So I'm given a simple three-part framework for, to guide the conversation. It's what are we great, each grateful for? Take turns on that. Um, what are we excited about in the future? And, and, and by the way, if you're like, I don't know, well then, damn, you're, you need to think of something. You need to create something to be excited about, looking forward to, right? And then number three, how can I be better for you? And, and don't, it doesn't need to be back and forth, right? Meaning, you don't need to say, all right, I, I, I asked you, now you ask me, <laughs> right? Ask me how you can be better for me, sweetie. No, no, no. Again, this is you going first. This is you being an amazing husband, regardless of how she responds. So weekly date night, make it meaningful. Um, and then overnight date once a month is ideal where somebody watches the kids and you guys can be free from responsibility. You can just be together. We go, we go out to dinner, do something fun and stay at a, like the Westin hotel in Austin. So it's 20 minutes away. It's super simple. We have a sitter for the kids and we come home and the next morning we do breakfast. We'll go paddle boarding. We'll do whatever. Right. But so weekly day night and monthly day overnight and the monthly overnight, by the way, we've only done that for a few months now and it has been a game changer in us being really connected right and then as far as the kids go hey how why why the why the overnight what's so different about that um it's the, i think it's the amount of time and space if you go out to if you go have a date night for a few hours you've got to you, you've still got we got to go home maybe even put the kids to bed right like it, it's not a lot of space to connect it's a very finite amount of time well so when you Sometimes date night's not special, right? And when you think about like, you just go to dinner, you're like, we do this a lot. We go to dinner a lot, right? Thank you. That's what I was, I started to say that and I forgot, which is I realized that we were doing this regimented, boring date night every week, same old, same old, one of a few different restaurants. Treat it like a date. Get dressed up. That's something we just started doing a, a few months ago too, yeah. is going from just like me and my work clothes grabbing the car keys, going to a restaurant, coming home. That was our date night. That's a shitty date, right? Imagine if you're dating a woman that you're courting, like that you're, you're single, yeah. you're dating her. And she's like, wow, you've taken me on three dates and they were all at the exact same restaurant. <laughs> and then we just went back to your house and you tried to have sex with me. Like, I, I want, I'm gonna, I, I'm, I'd like to break up with you now and I'm gonna go date a, a, my Prince Charming because you suck, buddy, right? Uh, yeah. Like that's how we date our wives. That sucks. Yeah. You need to treat it like a date. You both need to get dressed up. You should try a different restaurant every week. You should find ways to surprise her. You should get her flowers. You should call ahead and have the right, like do special stuff. Yeah. Surprise her, make it fun, dress up. Yeah, John, I'm thank you for, for pointing that out. Um, so yeah, I've done it the wrong way and the right way. Um, and then, uh, and then as far as the kids go, Hey, let me, let me ask, can, we, can I yeah. ask, a, like, I want to stick on that. If we don't get, oh no, yeah, the, please. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. If we don't get to the kids thing. It's okay. I, yeah, I like okay. that. I, I like that guys look where we ended up was talking marriage. Which Actually. Is, yeah. You know what? Let's save the kids for the next podcast. We'll do another podcast. Right? There you go. All right, cool. Thing. When it, when it comes to the marriage part, also, do you, how much do you think it matters that like the overnight that like, let's, let's get real here. Right. Like, I feel that with, and I've shared this on the podcast, that Tatiana and I, our sex life improved dramatically when we got a lock for the inside of our bedroom door that cannot be picked. Even with the, like the standard house door lock, you can, you know, put a little clothes hanger in and pick yeah. the lock. 
there's a, there's a bit of a fear with like the kids walking in. I mean, we have a 10 year old who can pick a lock, right? So you never totally feel safe and safety is a huge part of having a great sex life, you know, or, or being able to fully relax. And so when we got this lock for the inside of the door, that was a big, that was a big win. And I think that being in a hotel is very similar to that in the sense that it's completely, you're completely removed. There's no triggers, by the way, like, especially with a hotel, like at your home, in your home, even if you don't know it consciously, you've gotten into a fight in your bedroom before you've gotten into a fight in the bathroom before you you look around and you've got responsibilities, things that pop up. You're like, Oh, that laundry basket needs to be attended to, or there's all these triggers, right? Yep. So how do you feel that that environment, that hotel room has helped shape your connection in that space? So think of it this way. Um, I, I, something that I recently realized in my own life, but, but really in my marriage, cause I'm, you know, you're a student of Tony Robbins, you know, we all have our six human needs and variety is one and certainty is one. And some of us value one over the other, some one's low, one's high, et cetera. Right. So for me, my need for variety uh, in general, you know, I, I meet it in certain ways, but for the most part, you know me, right. I can eat the same thing every day. I can go to the same places every day. Like I don't need much variety. My wife's different. Um, right. But I'm always wanting to go to the same restaurants and, and so on and so forth. But if you think about it, this is true for all of us. And we'll use this. We'll use us. We'll use a song for an example. But anyway, new stimuli creates emotions in us that are very positive. Call them excitement. Call it infatuation. Right. And so like a new song, you know, a new song like, oh, yeah, this is that new song that's right eventually that new song becomes an old song. And yes, it might be an oldie, but goodie, but it does not stimulate you emotionally the way that it did the first 10 times that you heard it on the radio. You follow? And in the same way, for us to keep our marriage exciting and meet our wife's need for variety, we have to use different stimuli, new restaurants, new folks, uh, what was I saying? Uh, new, new, just new places, new environments, right? So it could be going to a park that you don't normally go to, or you only go there every so often. So it's a positive anchor, but it feels new because you don't, you only go there once a month or whatever, right? You could even camp in your backyard if you've never done that before. And, and that is a new environment. You and your wife, it allows you to connect while you are leveraging the benefit of the positive emotions that the new stimuli create. So that is my scientific explanation of, of why it is important to change your environment up and create new stimuli with which to enjoy with your wife. And I'll, I'll share one last thought on that. I, I, being that I don't need variety, I don't care about travel, right? I travel all the time speaking and most people that love travel, they like, they, they think I'm crazy. I go from the airport to the hotel give my speech, work in my hotel room, go back to the airport and go home. I don't care if I'm in, I did that in Italy. I, I mean, I, for the most part, I do it anywhere. I don't care. I literally, my wife has to say like I was in Italy and I would have stayed and not, she goes, you have to go see something. <laughs> I don't care. But here's, this is exciting for me. So my wife, when we retire, she wants to travel. And I'm like, Oh, that sounds terrible. <laughs> like, what a pain in the butt. I don't want to walk around and see Leaning Tower of Pisa and like, well, I don't, I don't care, right? But here's where I got excited. When I had the realization about the value of experiencing new stimuli with your wife, I went, oh, I don't give a shit about traveling, but I am excited when we retire, when the kids move out, for us to experience new stimuli all over the world, that every time we go somewhere we've never been, we are sharing a first together mm. and we are mingling our experience of life by sharing those emotions that new stimuli presents. And that's what our life's gonna be about, a big part of it for the rest of our lives. And so all of a sudden I told my wife, I'm like, hey, I can't wait to start traveling. She's like, what? I'm like, here's why. And she was like, oh, that's interesting. She's like, hey, whatever the hell it takes to get you to want to travel with me, I'm in, you know? So yeah, so really interesting. It also, by the way, there's a bigger picture lesson of how the way you think about, like, like Wayne Dyer said, the, when you change the way you look at things, the things you look at change. When I changed the way I looked at travel, 
travel completely changed. I've always hated camping because I don't like camping. And then I had, I changed the way I looked and realized, wait a minute, this is a way for me to be away from electronics and connect with my family at a deep level where there's nothing to do except talk and share experiences like hiking. And all of a sudden, I literally created an affirmation that said, I love camping. And again, I shared it with my wife and she's like, what the hell is happening to you? You're like, you're this different person. And anyway, so uh, yeah, for what it's worth, there, there's some, some consideration on why you should regularly, not when you're retired in the future, not only once a year, but every week and every month, share new stimuli with your wife and it will radically enhance your marriage. That's awesome, man. Hey, uh, I want to give a resource too today. <clears throat> I'm going to grab it real quick. Hold on. We don't have any time, John. Sorry, we ran out of time. I talked too much. <laughs> so guys, your, your, your action, one big action here is get that weekly date night set up and also your get an overnight set up, you know, because I think that might be uh, a lot of you are doing date night, uh, or at least a lot of you talk about doing date night. But uh, the overnight, I think is something that we all really need to get in the habit of like a monthly overnight. Um, and uh, also, on the topic of like getting to know your wife and dating your wife, check this out, buddy. I don't think I shared this with you. Share it's, it. The book is called 3000 questions about me. And what came up recently for Tatiana and I, um, I'll hold it up one more time there. What came up for Tatiana and I was uh, that I, I think she feels, and she said this in various ways that I don't really know her, mm. right? Like she's alluded to the fact that I might know, you know, that she's from Russia and that she, you know, like the basic things, but that I don't know her soul, right? That like all the things about her. Well, this book, I just get a chance to sit and ask her questions, right? And it's just like, I mean, dude, throw me a number, anything between one and 20,000. <laughs> 23. One and 3,000. Okay. So number 23, here's, here's what number 23 is. Um, number 23 says, uh, what is your most marked characteristic? What is your most marked characteristic? I'm not even sure I know how to interpret that one. I don't even know uh, what the hell that means. <laughs> uh, but I like it. We can figure it out together. All but, right, number 24. <laughs> uh, what do you most value in your friends? Who are your favorite writers? Who is your hero of fiction? Oh, here's something crazy, dude. You might not know this. I just, I just learned or relearned that Tatiana had a book published about her. Uh, do you Shut know up. this? Back in Russia. No. Dude, she had a book of poetry. She was the only kid in the school. They, they chose her poetry and decided to publish a book. So wow. things like that, um, we've been married for 10 years, together for 13, and I'm still learning things about my wife. But I'm excited to take this book out and start asking some questions. So guys, get the date night set up. Get the overnight set up. Buddy, this was a great conversation, man. Is there anything you want to say to wrap us up? No, I just, just that I just added 3,000 questions about me, the book, to my shopping cart. So thank That's you. Awesome, man. Um, no, man, I just, I, Hey, yeah, I'll say one thing. I want to acknowledge you brother. And I actually, I acknowledged you personally about this earlier today, I think. Uh, and I just want to acknowledge you in front of, uh, your, your front row dads, your listeners. And, and that is, um, and, and really for everybody listening, I'd encourage you to consider what mark you can leave on the world. And, you know, John, uh, you and I years ago, you, you realized the number one priority in my life is my family. And why wouldn't I align my work with that? And so you launched Front Row Dads. You know, this was once a goal, a dream of yours. And um, my mission professionally is to elevate the consciousness of humanity one person at a time. And as I told you earlier today, uh, you're, you are, well, you might not word it that way, but you know that you're elevating the consciousness of dads uh, on the planet. And that is therefore elevating the consciousness of the entire family that that dad is a part of. Uh, and, and so I just, I want to honor you and thank you because, uh, this is my most important role and you're a big part of making me realize that being a father is my most important role and being a husband, I guess that you're kind of neck and neck. It's a tie, but, uh, so thank you for that. Thank you for the work that you're doing. It's making a huge impact in the world and, uh, you're just getting started, man. I can't wait till every dad on the planet is a front row dad. Mm. Buddy, thank you so much, man. It's fun to build with friends. Uh, and guys, I hope all of you can get out there this week and not only uh, do what we've asked you to do with this, to set up a date night and an overnight, get that done. Check out this book, 3,000 Questions About Me. It might be a fun addition to one of those date nights. And, uh, and also to find somebody to connect with, like uh, you know, to have a brotherhood 
you know, whether it's one person, two people, so, some way to stay connected, right? Somebody to, to help elevate you uh, because of how they're living, right? And uh, find that person. I'm really grateful for our friendship, Hal. Thanks for being on the show again, man. And uh, I'll see you tomorrow for wake surfing. Love you, brother. See you tomorrow.